the season on. Oh, thank God. That would explain a lot. Well, no, the sound was on because, look, I can see it on the teleprompter. Huh. All okay, right. we're recording. Perfect. Hello. Hi. Um, this is the panel. If you're looking for a new say, stays like the song. Z. No, I mean, just you say, because the song is you say, stay. So you have to. What song? Stay by Lisa Lowe. Never heard of it, but okay. Thank you. you that is the entire song I predicated I, this panel on. I know. Okay. Well, you didn't tell me. Okay. So, hi. Um, hi, and welcome, and welcome. Welcome to, to this. this. Did we just say that at the same time we got a hate in here? Okay. Um, let's see. Hide the captions when the speaker is larger. Oh, someone wanted to see the dolls. I can show you a couple of them. Um, we'll see the dolls at, at, at the, the end. Yeah, at the end. And I'll, I'll show a couple. I'll take two so seconds. So, I'm right Rachel. Here. She, hers. I'm Ari, they, he, if, um, we're doing cosplay. We're doing cosplay. We're, we're um, podcasters, cosplayers, writers. I was going to say, we don't have a podcast. If you think we have a podcast, yeah, we you, just, you, you've never heard it. You weren't going to do that because it was going to confuse people. We, we do, do, we have, do a have a podcast. You can find me at Zari Tarazi. Those at, are my handles. Um, Who is, is someone calling me? Are you like, really going to take a call during no, the No, I worried it was someone from the team who was calling me like, hey. <laughs> hey, we shut it down. Shut hey, it down. Hey, you're doing so bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can find me at Alterian Rose on Twitter. Um, so we're here today to talk to you about the history of historical costuming. Sort yes, of. we're here to talk about historical costuming. And we're also here to talk about how to interpret historical costuming for yourself. Because something I've noticed is when you are looking into especially regency georgian let's say like georgian through regency, the Warrior, yeah. yes the whole, thing. the whole bridgerton thing and then even before it can be very hard to get into it mm -hmm. because you go to look in sort of the community and the cosplay community and the cost in the period costume community haven't really started meshing no um and so the barrier to one is much higher yeah, than the barrier to the other i found when i'm looking and i'm going to be teaching some hand sewing skills that i think will be very helpful for even just your cosplay use and this is actually going to be a little more cosplay centered with period fashion but it is one of those things where you look and it's just one woman who's like and this is my grandmother's from 1893 and she died in it. And you're like, oh, oof. Okay, you still have that even though it's very obviously haunted? Okay. I mean, what in England is not haunted. I, yeah, the entire, the entire. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell a quick Bridgerton story because it's my favorite thing while you yes. get your stuff ready. So I had surgery over the new year for my wrists. And um, because I'd gotten tested for COVID um, so I could go do surgery, they were like, my grandparents would come stay with us. You obviously tested negative. And I hadn't seen my grandparents in like a year. So I was like, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to hang out with you guys. And they needed a clean place to hang out post-surgery. Yeah. So we all hung out. And so Bridgerton was getting steam on Netflix at that point in time. I didn't really know a lot about it. Um, so I was like, yeah, sure. Let's watch this with my grandparents. This will be a good time. We got through the first four episodes and it was like, oh, this is fine. It's a little like, little raunchier than Pride and Prejudice. Like, who cares? No, but it's what I think was the fifth episode and the opening of it is just like, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's literally just the two main characters having sex, like an extended 10 minutes. And like, that's great. That's fine. I am actually totally for it, but I'm sitting there and my grandfather's on the other couch and I'm just not looking at him and he's not looking at me. And I'm just like, shut it off. Shut it off or fast forward. I can't live like this. It was so bad. I actually know for what it was, but that was just that moment where I'm like, this and, is a fucking nightmare. And so much like the trauma Ari experienced. It was really funny. Um, <laughs> like in the well, after. Life really is a hurricane. Life really is Similarly, like a hurricane. Similarly, there is a hurricane barreling towards us. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so actually one of the things I want to talk about while Rachel laces this is we're going over multiple different types of historical costuming. Mm -hmm. And if you do a little research, the thing I find really fascinating about two things. One, you have a lot of people, like not as much, but I used to see a lot more people going, well, obviously people were in plus size back in the day because there's no like plus size costuming left over. We don't see people plus size in magazines and photos and blah, blah, blah. 
And we don't have any clothes from that time period that are plus size. And first off, plus size is a modern construct. So of course you wouldn't. There's no ye oldie navy having like a plus size section. Ye oldie navy. <laughs> I know. But like, so one of the things we have to talk old about navy is- navy with a tharn. It's ye oldie the, the navy. Old, old this navy. <laughs> Navis. But um, the, we don't- Oh, what's up? The caption are trying to capture what we're saying it's, is an absolute it's, yeah, nightmare. Yeah, it's actually kind of I am so sorry. If you need us to repeat something, please just say so in the chat. If it's that old, it would just be Navy, Navis. But um, okay, so one of the things we have to talk about in terms of historical preservation is survivorship bias. Um, I'm pretty sure probably all of us have seen that picture of the plane riddled with the bullet holes. And people are like, well, those That's are- That's not bullet holes, those are survivors. Yeah, I know, but they're like points where it's like, oh, this wasn't getting the impact, you know what I mean? Yeah. So in any case, this is kind of like that, but for clothing where it's like, the stuff that we still have is stuff that by and large, the upper class and nobility wore once and then put in a trunk and then didn't touch for a hundred years. We don't really have garments as much that people wore day to day on account of them wearing them. So they wore them out and they were probably sold when that person died or just someone else wore them until they basically disintegrated. So this would have been happening a lot with, with the vast majority of clothing from this era. So saying, oh, we don't have any plus size clothes in that era is like, yeah, it was 200 years ago. Textiles don't really survive the way that like pottery bowls do. Um, and the other thing I find really interesting in terms of what we're going to talk about, you're going to be showing us examples of what? So we're going to start with examples of stays. Um, and the way we did stays is we got, there are a lot of actually great patterns on Etsy. Now, some of them might not be um, as size inclusive as we'd like. So that is something I'm also going to speak to. So basically, when you are downloading a pattern, it's best to look for historical, um, something that's more companies like McCall's and the big Buttercurk don't really have true stay patterns they don't really have a ton of actual historical stuff outside they of have stuff costuming but that's very really costumey so a pattern you print out which incidentally is best done on a paper size called a4 which is four inches longer nope i'm so sorry it's 0.4 of an inch longer than regular printer paper and that apparently matters i learned that one margins of error i guess yeah so you can see here you print it, you tape it, you have your boning channels here, you have a boning channel here. What's interesting about stays is that they have a boning channel that goes across the bust. So you can see if we were to be making this for Ari. That it wouldn't fit as it well, stands yeah. now. But much like a bra actually now, instead of the wire being under the bust, it's kind of here to keep the bust in like this hemline is doing on a modern garment. Yes. And so Ari actually had found some really great points about corsetry and history, if you wanted to share. Go for it while you, 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 you get yeah. going. Um, so one of the interesting things about all the stuff we're covering, which was we're doing stays, we're going to show a little bit of an example of the bustle. Um, and we're going to talk about hoop skirts at least, although we did not lug one up here, I don't think. Did you? Yeah, I'm not, if you've ever tried to put a hoop skirt in a car. We've had don't. to sit, we've had to sit in them. We were sitting in them. I was doing aerial and you were doing, I don't even think you wore yours. No. I wore mine. I'm doing aerial. I'm sitting in the back seat of this Uber. Lovely lady. Um, we were having conversation about as we're driving to the aquarium. This is in 2019. This was the, this everything was, was fine. This hmm? was fine. This was cool. This is like a dragon con from three years ago story, but I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm taking up 90% of the back seat of this car because a hoop skirt just goes sideways. Like really funny. it was really funny. But um, so I'm going to talk first about the interesting thing about a lot of the historical costuming stuff that I think the benefit of the modern ages has allowed us to flatten out where it's like the thing to understand about stays and corsets is they've existed since at least the 16th century. Probably stuff existed prior to that that was like basically not what we would think of even now as stays. But stuff like this has always existed because there have always been people with breasts. So what? I know, huge if true. Huge if true. So um, it's one of those things where huge, stays. Huge breast. Nice, nice. Um, I'll give you that one. That was good. Um, but and this is the kind of quality content you that you come, come here expecting for us. Um, so one of the important things to understand about stays and corsets is that they've existed forever because we've always needed them. Um, they were 
pretty much just what we had before bras. We don't, the idea of the bra is really modern, historically speaking. We only started making those around like World War II as a, uh, World War One. I'm sorry, World War One as a result of steel rationing. They were like, you guys, we, we need the steel for other stuff. You have to stop putting long strips of it into this like women's undergarment shorter and so the brassiere was invented um i don't know if that was the exact conversation but there you go so <laughs> one of the important things to understand is comparatively speaking stuff like bustles and hoop skirts and all of the, these are like flash in a pan fashion trends comparatively they would last for i mean fashion trends were much longer back then so they'd last like 20 years and then they sort of you know seeded away back out of importance and people went on to other stuff but we always had stays we always had corsets to some degree up until we invented other stuff to replace it because that stuff is not a fashion trend that is just a necessity trend stuff like bustles and hoop skirts is much shorter in terms of like fashion relevance, but it's interesting to me now seeing how people all sort of fat, flatten it out into like, this is historical clothing. This is just all the same level of history. These were all happening at the same time. It's fine. And listen, for dressing up a costume, who cares? Wear whatever. I don't like, yeah, I was a skirt gonna... and a bustle and of course like, yeah, sure. Keep throwing things on it and eventually it's fashion. Yes. Um, what What's actually, up? one of the points I wanted to make during this panel is, as you mentioned, you know, historically line up or people say, oh, there were no plus size people historically, which again is, is not just true. technically impossible. Yeah. Um, the human body would have to have existed in a different form until 1963, which to my knowledge, it did not. No. But again, I'm not a biologist. Um, <laughs> thank God. And thank God for that. Um, that time I said I'm never I'm not a doctor, and my sister just went, and you never will be. That's so mean. Yeah, she's 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 really good at those cutting remarks, yeah, huh? It's it, you know, and it hurts here <laughs> in the heart. Um, it doesn't really matter when you're doing costuming whether or not you are spun cotton like the oh, yeah God. They like they used to farm. They used and to literally farm it and do the loom, and, and then they you have know. to hand dye it, and it's not your family's, um, you know, crest check pattern. It that is all that is soft. It is very soft, actually. That is all totally fine. This is We're, truly if you don't have this, store bought is fine. Fine, but when it comes to textiles, like that is actually a really key determining factor in your budget. Stuff like that is not only expensive, it requires a certain level of technical knowledge that someone who is an, you know, an entry level participant may mm -hmm. not have. And that's totally fine. Um, I still make dying mistakes. Dying is hard. Um, it's something where I think, especially because there's not that overlap between cosplay and um, period clothing sort mm -hmm. of hobbyists, there's not a ton of like, hey, here's how to do this easier, guys, which is kind of our aim. We're trying to intersect these two because cosplay has become increasingly accessible. Um, I'm old, so I'm, I'm not old, I'm 26, but like I, I remember back when I started cosplaying, like, I mean, admittedly very amateurly because I was 14, but when I was 14, stuff like pre-bought, like pre-made cosplays were garish Halloween costumes. And now I go, last con we went to, Katsuko on? Oh God, yes. right before, right before everything. Um, the amount of people I saw walking around in really nice looking pre-made Demon Slayer stuff, I was like, oh my God. And that level of ease of access is maybe not realistic for everything in terms of period clothing. I don't think you're ever going to get like that level yeah. of like, buy now an entire uh, 1800s ensemble. Definitely not. I mean, maybe it really depends. The reason that you can see. At least like not for pop. major companies. Independent artists, maybe, but it'll run. It'll with something like um let's say demon slayer it can be produced on a machine very quickly yeah um for example the pattern for the dress i am working on which is a sort of regency it's an it's a pattern from around the 1860s uh -huh. and i'm using it to make sophie's blue dress from Howl's moving castle with a little bit with some twists and so what I did is I took the stays pattern. I have the same version and uh, I took the top of the dress and I combined them. 
because the stays were actually a little small and the top of the dress is what I had wanted. So you can see, is this the center? Is this? Are you the center? That's okay, take, take your, your time. time. Is in places where there were one bone on mine, I added two for extra support. And all you have to do, it's actually quite, it's a lot easier than you would think. Dynamic is, and flexible. Yes. I took pattern, something like this. I took the original pattern for the top, put that on paper. You can even just use it. You don't have to trace it out again if you don't want to. You line them all up and then you lay out the boning channels. Oh, that's a good mark. Mm -hmm. I was cutting those going. Do I have to mark that on the pattern paper? Yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> you cut out the boning channels and you place them on your garment. And that's why I do recommend, especially with period clothing, making a draft version first. This is actually a little big. I'm taking in the waist just because it's when it's something like this, I prefer it a little tighter. Yeah, well, they because it does they... have boning in it. And I feel like it goes to waste if it's just just sitting against you. Yeah. Yes. Which is another thing to consider where it's like, yeah, if I was just making like a spandex dress, for example, I would want that to be to measure, not slightly tighter, because then that's just uncomfortable. For something like this, the whole point is to restrict at least slightly. Um, the level of restriction Here, is actually up again. Oh, sure. So you can see as I'm making the final, you have it again with the boning channels outlined. And this will be sandwiched with a piece of cloth like this one. I had the top made and then I misplaced it. Classic. And so I'm in absolute agony. I'm sure it's around. That's and when what cleaning you, con is yes, for. When you sew it here like this, you are able to sew in a quarter inch bone. And when also just a little bit of side advice, when I put in the boning and the boning is a quarter inch in length, that means the channel is going to be five eighths of an inch that you have an eighth of wiggle room because I know for myself, usually if I do exactly a fourth, it's going to be way too small. And shoving it in is going to be a pain in the yeah. butt. You do have to account for seam allowance. Okay, 30 minutes left. Perfect. Totally Let's fine. start some stitches and then we'll do some wig stuff and then we'll take questions. And I can show you some of my dolls. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that person who asked, I love you. <laughs> So one of the first things. Oh yeah, you did that, and the cats were going nuts. So my cats have decided that they were going to lay down. My cats are perfectly well behaved, incidentally, and we're not other doing anything other than watching. Unlike your pin eating hooligans. No, they didn't sorry. actually eat any pins. No, they did not. But, but they did figure out how to pull them out, which, oof. which is very upsetting to me in my career. Yeah. So, right here, this is going to be a very puffy sleeve. It's an off the shoulder garment. So if you can just imagine this as the top. Do you want me to take off the space? You can just sort of. Oh, no, no. I'm just going to oh, show. Okay. It'll go here and then it will sit on the shoulder about this way. And so what you're looking here at here is something called a knife pleat. And the way you knife pleat something. Oh, boy. I'm not really sure how I'm going to hold my hands up to the camera. You can see I have marked Here, I'll hold this part. all across the sleeve, half inch boxes. And this is, I just used the pattern. I marked here, marked here, drew two straight lines, drew the half inches. You take one pleat here, you have your center line, you fold it over completely to the next line. I was getting this completely wrong the first time I did it. I thought it was just line to line. And that was getting really messed up and kind of was starting to look very warped. And so I just, you want a nice, it's not line to line, it's line over line. Just so, like that. So, so is it kind of like, you know, do you ever, did you ever sit in school and make those accordion folds out of your paper? It's exactly like making an accordion fold it's out of exactly paper. It's exactly like yeah. making an accordion fold out of paper because it kind of looked like that. Yeah. But it's also like, hey, it's gathering time consuming and annoying. Well, have I got a new style for you? Yeah. And 
Another thing I wanted to mention is the instructions for this garment actually mentioned that, oh, well, since this is an 1860s pattern, there weren't sewing machines. If you wanted to be really authentic, you can do it by hand. No. No. The answer is no. I've done hand gathering for doll fabric, and that took me 10 hours, and that was for a doll. Like, the answer no. Is, the answer is, and you know what else they didn't have in the 1800s? Kind of so, yeah, vaccines. You think still use those. I'm not, I don't play like that. Yeah, no, God. This there's, is also an example of a much larger pleat. A little more forgiving. And there's a lot of, honestly, one of the biggest tricks I have learned while making this stuff is that people just make things big by pleating it. Oh, thank you so much. It is really pretty. I love it so much. I'm excited. I also want to show you to here these red lines. This is just a basic basting stitch, which I cannot recommend enough when you're working with something like this. This is going to be a nightmare to put through the machine, but I can't really baste it tight enough that the pleats stay. So we're just going to put that one in God's hands. Oh, and I knocked a bunch of pins to the floor. That's fine. I have a gom jabar that we can suck it up with. This is what we call our pin cushions. I have a magnetic one. Um, so another thing I want to talk about while Rachel's looking for some stuff is I think the other thing I find fascinating is I research historical government uh, governments uh, yeah, as historical governments as well as historical garments is the myths that people still hold. Most people are whenever you talk about corsets or like, oh yeah, they were super restrictive. And I mean, it literally the event I, you see it less, but God, if I had a, if I had a dollar for every single time someone in a semi-historical or historical production was like, oh, I hate this corset. It's so restrictive. I'm going to go be a real woman and I guess just go full nude. I don't know what the, I don't know what their long-term plan was. Um, it was something where, hey, first off, that's not how that worked. And second off, what fascinates me is a lot of this stuff only cropped up, this, this, this anti-corset and stay pushback originates largely from the Victorian era because tight lacing was something that came into fashion because the initial corsets were hand sewn and thus too delicate for you to really like, mm, because- My hats are behind me, I'm just watching. Just in case, especially with pins. Um, they were too delicate for it to do, just snap and then you're out of garment. Um, but at that point in time, the moral pushback, because of course it was a moral pushback because it was a Victorian era and nobody was having fun. Um, legally was not allowed. Legally was not allowed. And it's really weird because the Edwardian era immediately, like uh, the, er, not the Edwardian era, there's after it. Um, the era immediately preceding it was significantly more chill. And so we have to kind of also understand the Victorian era as like a backlash kind of era um, to some of the relaxing standards around marriage and women and women's role in society. So people got really mad about these things being tight laced because they were convinced that not only was it like a frivolous overindulgence in fashion, which so, and also that it was like, basically women like it, that's bad. And there was a lot of pushback against it from a moral angle, but obviously most people didn't really care about the moral angle of it because most people don't really care. Um, so people doing that went, okay, well, where's some like extreme circumstances we can sort of push back Here, against? Push yeah, go for down. it. Oh, put stay down. Mm -hmm. Okay, go for it. Oh, no, keep talking. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I don't know if you need me to hold up something. Um, so one of the things we have to understand is that a couple of extreme medical cases of like tight lacing actually causing like deformity of the body were hyped up as the natural end result to every single person doing tight lacing ever. They had priests railing against it. They had a couple of, I mean, doctors, because at that point, I don't think they were washing their hands yet. So I don't, I'm not calling that a doctor. Um, they were that railing. That man was a barber. That man was a barber. Um, they would rail against it. They've inflated a couple of legitimate medical cases. And we still think about those things as sort of everybody was thinking this back then. This was the generally accepted attitude rather than the squeaky wheel getting the grease. And it's important to understand that none of this had any significant impact. People continued using corsets and stays because it's going to use. So something to understand that I think is really interesting is that nowadays we think that everybody thought that way or that this was the prevailing attitude of the time or had some significant impact. And it really didn't. These people were the equivalent of like fringe, fringe nut jobs on Infowars. Like they didn't actually have any major impact because again, this was a social necessity. necessity. I do just want to say though, for our own liability, uh, don't start tight lacing yourself because we told you oh, it yeah. was okay. 
I'm not saying it, it listen, uh, there actually were a couple legitimate medical cases of it causing deformity. Do not tight lace. You don't need to, especially with most modern equipment. You don't have to. If you sew it correctly and you sew it to your body and it's already kind of tight to begin with, you don't need to. Just wear more padding. Um, but it's also important to understand that basically all of our negative understanding of the corset comes from that period in time, despite that being almost the tail end of corsets, historically speaking. And because we flatten everything, because we flatten started. everything out into some vague period of like history. And listen, for picking out what you want to wear, I, that's fine. Like I'm going to put like an anachronistic stew together of a dress because I think it looks cool. Um, that being said, when it comes to actually understanding the history of the garment, it's important to evaluate these things in the larger context of this was maybe a decades long moral panic for a 400 plus year old garment. Like mm -hmm. it did not matter in the grand scheme of things in the slightest. I also just want to show, okay, a couple basic stitches. So I'm mm -hmm. going to do this hem for you because I do think having some hand stitching does really help, especially with historical garments. You want them to be a little more delicate sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so these are just things that I think can really help finish a piece. So first, just because I'm going to do a fancier stitch, when I say basting, you can just hold this up for me. You got it? To the camera like so. Right here. Oh, Put your okay, hands sorry. where my hands are. And your other hand here. It means that I'm literally, and normally I'd be doing this on a table. But for the purposes of the camera. But instead of, I used to baste completely wrong. I used to do it like, uh, and then pull it all the way and, and it gets, and you can already see it's getting tangled on the microphone. Yeah. And it broke and it was just a mess. So when you base the fastest, sorry, way to okay. go is just start with a little tail over here. Under through, and you always want your needle to end up on top. You never want it to be going through the back. You only want a little space between stitches and each stitch should be about half an inch. So let me just hold that up. You're good. In fact, if I tilt this down, can you? Yeah, actually yeah. that's perfect. Okay. Now comes the hands portion. And so what I'm doing here is a hem stitch. I like that that came up with Porsche. Love close captioning software. This is also a single thread. It's not doubled. You want to keep the tail pretty long so it doesn't get tangled. And so you can keep having thread as you go. I've just pinned it for visual aid as well and to help myself because we're trying to do this on a time constraint. I've learned it's actually not great to constantly be using pins. That hasn't really stopped me, but it's not actually an ideal situation. Depends. Also depends on the kind of, like, you don't need to for cotton, for example, but if you're sewing something slipperier, you might also need the benefit of pins mm -hmm. and just about knowing the, the, the texture what of are the you garment. Doing? No. She's just rubbing her face. Huh. Oh, yes. We actually have wax. Wax. Super useful. I started using it. I'm like, damn, this changed my life. Yep. So I'm actually working on the hem of the back of the skirt right now. The skirt has that pleating I showed you before, which is how it gets its volume. Um, to build a bustle, this pattern actually has you make the same skirt a little shorter mm -hmm. and then add in a little almost like butt pad. Yeah. Like you would sit on. Yeah. Oh, and my cat's here. Hello. So... What I also want to fundamentally point out about fabric. She's sitting behind you. She is? Okay. Yes. Wait, does everybody want to see? Okay, hold on. Quick no, cat shot. she's sitting behind. Oh, no, she's walking. Of course, now that. Oh, wait, hold on. Maybe she will let us show her. And the fabric. Kitty, kitty. <laughs> she does not. She's camera, okay. camera shy all of a sudden. Now that you want to be, now that I'm, now that I'm calling you out, you don't want to be on camera. Of course not. Also, hold on. You dropped it. There we go. Did I drop my needle as well? Probably. Oh, good. Good, good, excellent, great. <laughs> what I want to point out about fabric, and this is true even for, you know, I'm not sure how well you can see on just my webcam, but it's made of, it's all fiber. It's not just sort of one amalgamous thing. When you are sewing hems, 
it is possible to make your stitches by hand nearly invisible. Which I would show you if my needle had not gone. The needle? No, those, no, are, those pens. are pens. Okay, let me go get the gum jar. Okay. Also, I think the microphone fell out. So we're, uh, the microphone plug fell out. So perfect. Rocking, rolling. <laughs> minds. We're changing hearts and minds all over the place. Listen. All right, there we go. The level and I plugged it in the wrong way. If you have come to expect. It's completely. I mean, hey, listen. I'm just trying to figure out how to plug this back in. Is this so, how did this even happen? I'm blaming your cat. No, I'm not. Do you see what you do, Tarazi? But, it would be but you don't think about that. You only think about yourself. <laughs> I am literally, I plugged Hold it on. in. I got it. There we go. Okay, we're good. We're back. Here, do stuff. You're not allowed to find this sex. <laughs> My needle was in front of me the entire time. Okay, well, you know what? All right, put the fabric down. So a couple of fun stitches for you in your day-to-day, -day, in your costuming, in your cosplay, Here, but especially for hems on skirts. Um, and listen, if you make princess dresses, it's going to take a long time, but uh -huh. it does really make a difference. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going this way, but my needle is pointed in the opposite direction. This is a cross stitch. So you take the back of your hem and you put it through just like this. I also can't see the chat right this second, so I hope nobody is has any pressing concerns. We will answer questions. Somebody's like, there's I... a heron attacking me right now. What do I do? And first off, why are you asking us? But so what's really important about doing this kind of stitch on a skirt is that when you go to pick up thread up here, you're only doing like a single fiber, maybe one or two. And you're doing it very gently because if you do this along the whole skirt, it will hold. I mean, obviously, don't go mountain biking. Yeah. If you're mountain biking in your ball gown, we have honestly different yes different we priorities, have, we have different problems. Then we as well. have other. You know, if you're mountain biking in your ball gown, then you know God we've can't got help you. necessity <laughs> breeds invention. At the very least, make it a short ball gown. Also quite so one and we do our little fiber pickup as close to the surface as possible. Do your fiber pick up as close to the surface as possible, incidentally, because I know you were whispering that. I don't know if it got picked up, but yes. I didn't mean to whisper it. No, it's okay. That's why I repeated Hold it. Hold on, everyone. My needle came unthreaded. Okay. We fixed it. So an important lesson to understand from this is sewing is frustrating, even if you are Here, an see, advanced. See how seamstress. I have the one fiber? Honestly, also, here are my horrible nails. I, I am a habitual nail biter, and I apologize. But it is you important see that to understand. Little cross. What's up? Ooh, yeah. You and then we just pick up the hem again, bring it back, and that you get that little cross. Mm -hmm. And if you look on the other side, you can sort of see a little dimple where it is, but that is also if you have suit pants or anything like that, that is one way of creating an invisible hem yes. on these kinds of dresses. Yes. Combine it. Unfortunately, we have to combine it with the basting thread, but the basting thread is separate from the... Yes, I can actually... Hold on. I'm just... If you just pull it out. Yes, Tomas? Great. Now the other one's here. I have pulled out the basting thread, and so if you look at my hem... No thread. Uh, hi, welcome back. Hello, welcome back. Hi, it's us again. <laughs> I like also I was doing the Miss Bellum thing for a minute. There, just because our difference on height. Hi, us again. Another stitch I just want to show you very quickly, and this is great for waistbands. Oh, there she goes. Is when we take two pieces of fabric. They're so um, invisible yeah. hems are, but, but they're so pretty. And it's one of those things where if you know that this is a garment you're going to wear a lot, mm -hmm. do an invisible hem. Sit down and take the time. Um, honestly, put a podcast term, on. Put a podcast on. Sit there for a couple hours. I would also recommend, depending on the size of the piece you're working with, I'm actually looking into getting like a drafting desk because I was cutting out patterns for this for the stays. 
and I probably took me about four or five hours and I have to spend most events. I'm like, this is, this is not a, this is fine for like a one-time event, but if I'm doing this like every day or if I'm doing it even once a month, it's going to have long-term consequences on your back health. And since nobody wants to have a bad back, it hurts, get a, get something where you can hold it up and sit down and work on it from there because it will save you so much pain. Like also we're about to hit the 10 minute mark. Oh, okay. So what else do you want to do? So I'm going to show oh, I'm stitch gonna, and then the hair stuff. I'm going to show one more stitch and then this hair stuff. I know. So, I'm like, I didn't put this wig on for my health. Although it is really bouncy. It's just really weird because my hair is all slightly longer. So I'm like, Ooh, and my mm -hmm. hair's not usually this light. So we have our two things of fabric. They're sandwiched together. Oh my gosh. Sorry. And this might be, for example, the waistband of a skirt. And, or this would be the skirt part. And this part would be the waistband. See how it's folded over here. So let's go back to my hands. This one's really fun, actually. Here, hold on, because I don't think people can see the, oh, are you folding it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this one, you see how I have a loop, a little hole here? I'm going to put my needle in. I'm going to have it come out right here. I'm going to stick it into this fabric. Directly underneath, about a quarter to a half, uh, no, let's say only a quarter, directly below where it exited. Mm -hmm. Enter, about a half inch here, pull it out. And this is how you create waistbands and other sort of invisible stitches because once I pull this through, it's covered by this. So that's how you sandwich things like uneven hems. Well, not even uneven hems, but when you're doing a Just waistband and you're wondering hem. on your clothes, oh, how does this vanish? Because you're using the space between the fabric to create your garment. And also just, I'm using this purple thread so you can see what I'm doing. Normally I recommend using something that actually matches the garment. Just in case. It is an invisible hem, but still. Yeah. All right. Hair stuff. Yes. Ooh, good to know about the um yeah, out, we the are Michaels out in flushing. So yeah. I think that's a different Michaels. We went to a Michaels in Long Island once and it was kind of haunted. Yes, but it's one in flushing. So we'll have yes. to look. That is actually really good because I I also really need one. So yeah. I mean, what isn't haunted? Yes. I'm certainly haunted. So I'm gonna go what? make you hit that one up. Yeah, life. Okay. Thing we're gonna do i just want to show do you need me to lean forward no i'm just gonna twist you okay ah, it's fine i'm from new one jersey the, this is this is normal one of my favorite things i saw in the sort of regency shows is just hair that sort of it's not really super pulled back in the front but it's pulled back more here and I just really love showing off how to Dutch braid instead of French braid, because for some reason I cannot French braid to save my life. So what you want to do for Regency or, you know, for more Bridgerton styles, like I saw one like I'm wearing right now, where you have a flower sort of towards the back of the head, is you start with something that's pretty close to the front, but it's not exactly this front piece. Mm -hmm. And then you just pull it in. I'm also, we're going to start taking questions. Yes. You gather. It's not as tight. If you want a tight style, that's up to you, but. Since it's a wig, you can probably afford to go a little yeah. tighter. It's not your actual hair. If it's your real hair, uh, take it easy. You don't want to get um, bald spots or anything. Yep. Yeah. And so this is also just how you do it without accidentally, you know, braiding the whole thing. I also get, do we I, see any, do you see any questions? 
I wish I, get, I can't no, see. not right now. Okay, I always get really confused when I'm braiding. Like I can tell just right now I dropped something. No, I added okay. it to the wrong strand or something. No, it, it, braiding is a finicky process. I've gotten better about it because I have had to braid. I braided a bunch of ponies' hair while I was moving for storage. Um, so then with their hair getting tangled up in transit, so I got good at those like three, three, See, just, three plates. I completely but... have been skipping this strand over the other. Well, that happens. But also, here's a cheat. Anka hair, that's what you call a cheat. Henry, if you're fancy. Really? Right. What? Did you come to my panel. I, I don't want to, didn't you make that like, the, that, that you, seriously? Huge boobs of true, huh? I think huge boobs, if true, is extremely funny. Oh, and that Henry of Harris. <laughs> and you would just, your turn? Hi. Yeah. And then it's really quick and easy. And honestly, here's my number one trick, which is just adding flowers. Hairstylist, hate her. <laughs> Sorry. Adding flowers to shit instantly. I did it for. people think that you know what you're doing. Oh, yeah. Well, also, it's kind of a good way to cover up any sort of inconsistencies in the braiding. I did um, Emperor Edelgard. I don't know if anyone here knows Fire Emblem. Did that at Katsu before the bad times. And um, one of the ways that I also just thought it would look really pretty, because her hair is actually pretty much this shade, although slightly vanilla. And I put a bunch of flowers in around the two mm -hmm. Leia buns because, God, it saved me so much effort in terms of having to circle the west around that mm -hmm. and it just looked nice a little pop of color on my head uh put flowers on stuff that's for historical costuming it's, actually, it's my you bottom know the, line really is just throw flowers put a bird it. on it i mean do put a bird on do it do put a bird on it honestly listen that was people would have like like bird cages and stuff like whatever just go nuts like fashion is, 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 is a lot weirder than we think it is. And also there's nothing wrong with adding a sort of modern couture sensibility to old school fashion, because again, we're not actually living in the 1800s anymore. Machine sew your clothes, use modern fabrics. Like we invented, like if somebody from the 1800s walked into a Joann's right now, they would go buck wild. The moon? The moon? The moon in the sky? The moon in the sky. I mean, yeah, like that's also admittedly one of those, like, yeah, the moon? Oh, those flowers look so pretty. Um... Yeah, and then I literally. Hold on, sorry, let me stand up a little straighter. Just go to the other side. I am actually, incidentally, for the purpose of this panel, I am wearing a corset underneath this, even though it's just a simple spandex dress. But hey, you can just sit around in these. They're actually not uncomfortable. People are like, oh, car and corset. And like, honestly, for me, no, they're fine. Um, sure, wearing them in. If you wear something and it's uncomfortable, obviously shop around until you yeah. find something that's comfortable. Don't they be should like, well, be comfortable, it's supposed though. to be comfortable. So, you know, that obviously is going to take some testing. Yeah, don't be afraid to test it. Don't be afraid to try it out. And prioritize your comfort level. I'm saying this is somebody who's cosplayed long enough. I am well past that point in my life where I'm like, I'm going to sit around and be uncomfortable for seven hours and something. Like, no, that's not fun. And you're not going to take any fun photos because you're going to be hot and miserable and in pain. You're better off finding something that works for you in terms of a comfort level. And that can be dictated by you, you know, your sensory needs, your texture needs, your sizing needs. Um, prioritize your comfort above literally everything else in costume. Obviously, sometimes you make trade-offs and, you know, make the trade-offs that work best for you. You want to wear a slightly tighter corset. You think you can handle it. You know your body. But also maybe consider the weather of the event. Like, I dress differently for a con down in Atlanta than I do for a con in October up here. There, instant period hair. ta -da! It's actually really pretty. I mean, not that it wouldn't, but it's nice. It actually kind of frames it, frames the pearls really nicely. Okay, so we have three minutes if anyone has questions. Otherwise, we're just going to do some comedy free balling. I mean, yeah. Oh. Oh. Also, because she's really close. So this is Valentina. Dolls! This is Dolls. She's actually kind of, oh God, the lighting is actually not super great. She's a Dracula Laura. Um, one of the first ones I actually did with watercolor pencil. I was mostly doing acrylics before then. Um, who do I have that's not? I'm like, I don't, yeah, no, her face is really fun to do. Uh, watercolors and a lot of sealant. This is not necessarily a doll customizing panel, um, but there's a ton of people who do it on YouTube apparently. And I'm like, should I start doing that? But I'm also like, oh God. Uh, good stays. Where do you, um, have good you bought stays. them straight up? I have not bought stays, unfortunately. I can tell you, you can buy good boning and stuff to make stays from something like corsetsupplies.com. Do you actually happen to, I don't know if we have the time for this, do you know where the paper is? Actually, one of the stay patterns we bought, because I was reading over it to make sure I was cutting out everything correctly, yes, is from... had a list of resources um, where they're like, hey, this is where you buy supplies. And some of these places that you buy supplies from are also corset stores. They may have stays. 
Does this have the yes, red this is threaded? Red threaded is where we got this from. And all the supplies I got from it, um, including the boning and the boning tips, are from corsetsupplies.com. Um, Someone in the chat also said Burnley and Trowbridge, which is a great pattern company for historical patterns. And with a name like that, it had better be. Yeah, I mean. Burnley and Trowbridge. <laughs> Very fancy. Yes. Extremely fancy. Do I have any, any favorite pre-made chemises? Um, I am honestly someone who would rather do a petticoat than a chemise. Some people like to do both, but I'm not really a chemise person. Also because of... Oh yeah, Colonial oh, cool. Williamsburg. Yeah, that would do it, huh? Just because of the way my bust is, chemises usually have that empire cut, and then are and that just I, I don't do like wearing cut. those. I can't do an empire cut. It's not happening. I just oh god, I was re I, I introduced a friend to Pride and Prejudice 2005, one of my favorite movies, and I was rewatching it with them. And I'm just looking at all the costumes like this would look horrible on me. Oh my god, this is a nightmare. Um, so you know. Don't, don't, do, I don't do chemises You don't personally. have to wear an empire waist. You guys please can don't, do, please you don't. can do a Bridgerton group AU for what, literally what just the drop like? that waistline down. Drop the waist I don't know. Bridgerton you can, stuck you still do that. I Are we know. illegally allowed to say that? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, but like legitimately like drop the waistline a bit. It doesn't have to be because like if you it, then you're not going to be having a good time. Don't be afraid to drop the waist a little. And if someone comes along and goes, that's not an actually an accurate empire waist, you can tell them to accurately empire waist their way out of your face. Maybe come up with something a little punchier than that, but, but you know, you know this, we're is, this is for children. We this don't want to say anything inflammatory. Yes. It is? This is a no, channel this... for children? I'm pretty sure I swore. I mean, listen, is it? Are we not all God's children? In a hot car? Yes. Um, so it's one of those things. I think I guess our, <laughs> our, our yeah, okay, that's what it picked up. So I guess our closing remarks, we have 39 seconds, are make historical costuming work for you. You are not a slave to period accuracy. You are not necessarily bound by the constraints and conventions of the time. We're not why cavemen. Are we, yelling, we have technology. Why are we yelling this like we're about to be fucking run through <laughs> like a time an, portal? Like it's an event horizon, like the, the, the apocalyptic. No, because it's just. Closing remarks should be delivered forcefully. I don't know, whatever. This is like debate club. Okay, listen, you're not a slave to historical accuracy. Don't worry about it. Joann's, great. Any other fabric store you can get to, great. If you can shop local, great. I, I don't know how many local fabric mm -hmm. stores still exist. But the point being, shop within your budget, shop within your comfort level, make stuff within your comfort level, and don't be afraid to have fun. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. I will be, I'm going to be at the um, info booth. Um, that is my shift from 2.30 to 5 as the con goes on if you would like to ask any separate questions. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful day and enjoy FlameCon.